Welcome to this special lecture from the School for Advanced Research. I'm Doug Schwartz, back from the grave. <laughs> Our speaker tonight, uh, as many of you who were here last time know, received his PhD from the University of New Mexico in anthropology and later received an honorary Doctorate of Humane Letters from his undergraduate institution, West Virginia Wesleyan University. He, after his degree and really starting before he received his PhD, did extensive archaeological work in the Southwest, Ecuador, Alaska, and Mexico. He has a passion for teaching, received a Student Service Award from the University of New Mexico, has written 12 books, including Anasazi America, which has sold 25,000 copies. For over a decade, he was associate provost at the University of New Mexico, solving problems and initiating uh, new programs. Well, one incident in his life, however, I didn't talk about last time that I want to mention today is when he graduated as an undergraduate, he didn't have enough money to pay for his first graduate year, so he took a job in a western Pennsylvania reform school. He was so appalled at the treatment of especially the young inmates who were incarcerated uh, with hardened criminals uh, that he objected, he irritated, he worked for change within the institution and initiated a program which eventually shut the whole institution down in later years. <laughs> I recommend to you uh, a book that he published in 1999 called The Morganza, 1976, Life in a Legendary Reform School. This is a, a brutally honest, gripping uh, insider's view of a broken juvenile jurist system. I recommend it to you, and it really shows another side of our speaker, that humane side, which uh, is so obvious to those who know him. And that's why it gives me such great pleasure to introduce the interim president of the School for Advanced Research, David Stewart. Thanks for the introduction. That's the legendary Doug Schwartz, and I do emphasize the word legendary. This evening, in addition to entertaining whoever was out there with the car with the license plate 666, well, I guess we have a special guest here to listen to the lecture tonight. <laughs> I want to talk to you today about the high period of Chaco and society that most anthropologists and archaeologists refer to as the Chaco phenomenon. And as we get into that, I want to remind you, uh, for those of you who were not here uh, several weeks ago, that the progression over six centuries of change and growth and development from the 200s AD to the 800s AD built the foundation and generated the practical problems that eventually the Chacoan system would attempt to solve. Those changes included increasingly hard work which cost more and more calories for a family to survive each year. That hard work and increases of population from the 200s to the 800s of at least 30-fold in population meant that there were many more people on the same regional landscape trying to extract calories 
and competing with one another for farmland, especially places where wet farms could be placed, wild game and the protein and nutrients that came with meat, and wild seeds and vegetables. All of that meant more work, more kids, more farms, more risk. And in the process, that growth was paid for partly by dozens and dozens of small incremental efficiencies. One of the most notable was the transition from stone boiling technique to pottery in terms of human consumption. Others were larger and more sophisticated grinding surfaces on tools. Better hoes, harder digging sticks, more finesse in the details of horticulture accrued over those six centuries. Small incremental steps that led to the seven and eight hundreds AD and an explosion of trade at that time in black and white and gray on brown and so on pottery, bowls. The bowls were all roughly equivalent one to another, but traded very vigorously. Why? Simply because trading partnerships meant that if you didn't receive rain in a year, didn't bring in a full crop, you might have a place to go to trade for corn, or most precious of all, seed corn, through the exchanges of pottery at other times. That's the prelude to the Chacoan system. So let's take a bit of a look at what the high period created that's above and beyond six, eight room farmhouses and two and three pit house dwellings. Could we have the slides, please? That is the great Kivra at Chetro Kettle, next door to Pueblo Benito. Uh, the stone discs were originally placed there in the ground and encircled to keep the weight of the massive entire Ponderosa roof beams from pushing the roof down into the ground. That is on a scale that no one alive in the 200s, 400s, 600s could have ever imagined, and dates to the mid 10 hundreds AD. And crushed turquoise was beneath each of the posts. May we have the next slide, please? And right next to Chetro Kettle, you have people who lived in cliffside dwellings of a small scale. So within hundreds of yards, you have bigger and slightly smaller. Next slide, please. Now, this is a composite done a few years ago. There's some updates to it, but I didn't have one that tells you and shows you of some of the growth at Pueblo Benito. Most archaeologists reckon the founding date of Pueblo Benito at 919 A.D. And they reckon it because of the above ground rooms and the kivas. This was the early ark. I argue it slightly differently. Pueblo Benito was in fact founded in the 800s A.D., as several pit dwellings, which became some of the earliest kivas, and banks of storerooms above ground in the classic Pueblo I style. Pueblo I period is called Pueblo as opposed to basket maker by archaeologists because of the above ground architecture rather than just pit houses. 
But Pueblo Benito was founded as a Pueblo I settlement with two residential pit houses and above ground storerooms that were larger than average in the late 800s AD. I will explain that in a moment. It then goes on and gets expanded forward and upward. Forward and upward. And then in its last phase, two phases, most of the ritual space is added. So Pueblo Bonito and the other early great houses don't start out as great ritual structures. They start out as residential structures with an unusual amount of storage space. That makes sense. And it makes sense because the 700s AD, particularly the late 700s, were ones of enormous variation in precipitation year to year, season to season. And that forced a population that had gone from a few hundred families in the 200s AD to five or 6,000 families spread across the four corners in the 600s and 700s AD to experiment in several dimensions. Some created large villages with lots of labor. The type site for Pueblo I is Alkali Ridge, and it's got 80 or 100 pit houses in it, way larger than the average for the time. It was only occupied for about 40 years or so, and its own size created the seeds of its destruction. There wasn't enough firewood around, there wasn't enough uh, return on the corn, and it begins to break up in size and fade away. And so the late 700s and early 800s were a period of enormous experimentation where the Pueblo I families were experimenting with increasing storage space everywhere in farmsteads. The amount of storage space between 600 and 800 AD in farmsteads, the ordinary farmstead, tripled. And then it never rose again. And it never rose again because in the 800s AD, a few specialized sites began to have the big storerooms. And the three of the earliest at Pueblo Benito were Una Vida, Peñasco Blanco, and Pueblo Benito. And as each grew, they became more complex and more expensive. May we have the next slide, please? Multi-story architecture at Pueblo Benito. Lavish walls, banded, been whole coffee table books, papers, and seminars on the styles of the banding in the walls. Broken down into subtypes. But what we need to know in terms of the calories and the dynamics is if you were going to build multi story, which couldn't be done without renovating walls at the back of Pueblo Benito, you needed wider and thicker walls and deeper foundations than if you were going to just build one story. And carrying the stone and the ponderosa beams and the dirt, packing six inches of dirt between the five floors, was all labor that got more and more expensive the higher you raised it. So the fifth floor cost a whole lot more to build than the first floor. Now there was space. Chaco Canyon has space. It's got plenty of space. And so part of the object had to have been to express the power, the cost, and of course many of those upper rooms were storerooms. About 60% of all the space 
in Pueblo Benito, a storeroom. About 20 to 22 percent is residential room. And in spite of the fact that many, if not the majority of my colleagues, view such a great house as a ritual center, and it surely was, only 18 percent of the space at Pueblo Benito was devoted to ritual. So my argument is that the Chaco system at its heart was a practical, problem-solving, quartermaster redistribution operation regulated in the guise of religious, religious ritual. More about that in a moment. And I would like you now to see the next slide, an original ceiling at Pueblo Benito. Sandstone. Vigas. Latias. Bark, shaved bark, dirt, another floor, and so on going up. That was taken about 40 years ago, and that's a 950-year-old a ceiling. Remind you of anything in Santa Fe, does it? <laughs> and we know what an adobe with those ceilings costs in Santa Fe. So how good were they in the construction? That's a 950-year-old room. Now the last thing I want you to see is an object, the last slide. That is a cylinder jar. Dogozi style, D-O-G-O-Z-H-I is one of the variants of the spelling. Lightning design, black on white, and they are only found in great houses. That style of pottery and that shape is only found in great houses, and it was used in the ceremony and preparation of drinking cacao chocolate, which was imported from either West Central or East Central Mexico. We're not sure yet. Patricia Crown at the University of New Mexico has done much of the research on this. And guys like me who studied in Mexico for many years went, man, those look, look like chocolate jars out of the Maya country. Um, indeed, that tells you that at the height of Pueblo Benito, it had an economic reach of 15 to 1600 linear miles. Not bad. A bigger reach than anyone in colonial America had going west, and a year-long reach going the other direction to the continent. So now let's take a look at this map. This map is my, <laughs> yeah, my wife paints. She would describe this simply as um, pathetic. <laughs> yeah. And my students would, at UNM would go, oh, he's not trying to draw again, is he? Yeah, the answer is yes, I'm trying to draw again. What we have here is the central San Juan Basin. We have the San Juan River, we have the Animas, we have Mesa Verde, we have Lobo Mesa and the Dutton Plateau in here, the Red Mesa Valley, Gallup on one end, uh, the Puerco on the other end, and that's what you drive through when you're on I-40 going west. You're driving through two sectors of the Red Mesa Valley, uh, the high countries around Thoreau, New Mexico, um, and that was the first big farming district that traded huge quantities of pottery into Chaco Canyon in the late 800s to mid 1000s AD. I'll explain in a minute. Mesa Verde was connected to Chaco Canyon. Recent research suggests 
that Pueblo Benito and perhaps at least one of the other great houses from the style of pottery was influenced by Mesa Verde. You've got river and mountain systems and this is basin country. Chaco Canyon is roughly here. Chaco Canyon is half the distance. We talked about the roads the last time briefly. Half the distance from north to south. It breaks up the cost of a trip taking goods from Mesa Verde into the Chaco and Heartland as opposed to taking it all the way down to the Red Mesa country or vice versa. And what the Chaco and world did was connect these elements and solve a problem. For hundreds of years, perhaps even thousands, two rainfall regimes, one to the south and east, which was monsoon driven, single season, that is unimodal summer monsoons, drove the summer weather and precipitation. One, one season rainfall district roughly here, as opposed to the district north and west where climate off the Pacific Ocean as opposed to the Gulf of Mexico drove precipitation patterns and most precipitation came in two peaks a year bimodal rainfall distribution um, midwinter in terms of snowpack and then some scattered through the summer. What I believe that Chaco Canyon did in those first three great houses was begin to connect the summer dominant rainfall district with the bimodal winter summer split district which means the conditions on one side of the San Juan Basin for agriculture could easily vary from the other each year. In other words, it was a risk reduction buffering technique. In addition to that, after the 800s AD and into the early 900s AD, this system begins to expand and draw population from the perimeters. It is clear that the Mesa Verde district lost population through the late 800s and 900s AD. And that some of those folks were amalgamating in the greater Chacoan core. You also have some population moving out of the higher country, the Carrizos, the Chuscas, the Lucachucais that separate New Mexico and Arizona. And in the process of coming closer to the basins, every one of those farmers gained something valuable, which was a longer growing season, a later fall frost, an earlier spring frost, and more days of the year in which to get large cob development if rain fell, if a snowpack was deposited. It clearly was often enough that the system and the region and the number of farmsteads continued to expand and to grow. The cold nighttime temperatures of the higher country, even in a great year, retard the size of cob development. High country, small cob corn. Basin country, larger cob corn. So we not only have the Chacoan world beginning to move goods across this shadowy rainfall regime where you get these two conditions. You have it also pulling people in to a district 
where they get longer growing season. And the growing season was the longest because it's colder further north and warmer further south that the Red Mesa District became the first great corn producing exporting district in western North America. Its rise through the 900s AD is pronounced enough that the predominant pottery at Chaco Canyon came from in this, this area. The first early great houses to be exported from Chaco Canyon in a growing Benito style were put in the Wingate area near Fort Wingate along the Puerco of the West. And so what was the sighting of early outlying great houses was such that, okay, the guys in Chaco Canyon had already begun to, in my view, make a market, take the risks, and in the process, export the idea of a big box storeroom place that had ritual. The ritual regulated it. The ritual glued it together. The ritual made it part of everyday society in somewhat the same way that the idea of democracy sells us on lots of things as well. Some of them smart and democratic and some of them not so smart and not so democratic. And it's very clear that from the rate of growth of the great houses in Chaco Canyon, expanding in number and size during this era, that the people who were doing the best were the ones who were doing the least farming themselves and didn't make much pottery at all, which is the Chacoans in the, in the central core great houses. They were doing better, but doing less work less farming, less manufacturing. Um, I think of them not only as great house elites, but as percent brokers. <laughs> I have colleagues who disagree, but they've never tried to farm themselves. As the system expands, and the number of farmsteads approaches 10,000, 12,000, 14,000, and so on, through the 10 hundreds, there are other risk factors that the system has to deal with that now become important. Because limiting factors that are of no consequence with a small or medium-sized population can become crushing factors with a larger population, and that's what was going on. So the secondary factors, in addition to elevation, length of growing season, bimodal, as opposed to unimodal distribution of rainfall, involve the risks of patchy rainfall that is so characteristic of major portions of the American Southwest. That patchy rainfall means that it's going to rain somewhere, but one does not know exactly where. And farms in one district, one or two of them might prosper even as the others stay bone dry. And it always seems to be the case that when you most want water here in the southwest, you can see it falling someplace where you go, that's just not important, that's not where I need it. I don't know exactly how that conversation was phrased through the 9 and 10 hundreds AD, but I can tell you that what Chaco did was start to export more great houses. And it exported great houses that were in the style, architecturally, but on steroids and built to mill specs because those walls at Pueblo Benito, no one ever saw them when Pueblo Benito was lived in, they were covered over with plaster and adobe. So the cost of the walls was mill specs, 
mil-spec. We are going to find the most cost solution to our great houses. Some of these guys could have, could have and may have worked at the Pentagon. <laughs> and in the process, what they're doing is absorbing labor, making a market in labor, and they are exporting the model of architecture that is most comfortable to the folks who've been building the small farmsteads since the mid-800s A.D., even as the farmsteads in Chaco Canyon, per se, remain most of them in the P1 and some of them even the late basket maker style of pit houses with above ground storerooms. So the advances in architecture and the advances in production of corn and the push for the development of large cob corn, which was done in the Red Mesa Valley, are all frontier innovations that are being absorbed and benefit the quartermasters, the logistic partners, the engineers of the redistribution system. And the more farms that got placed, the more great houses were built, filling in part of the central core of the Chacoan world. It only took, in a square mile, a cluster of 15 to 20 farmsteads by the mid 10 hundreds A.D. to get you a Chaco and Great House. But other things had happened in that period. Corn, Indian maize that is, is an easy crop to grow under, under sweet circumstances of plenty of groundwater, etc. It's tough in marginal rainfall regimes. And the thing that you need to sort is that if you are dry farming, you are at a very different level of risk of your crop failing than if you're wet farming. All of the old wet farming places, as in the, the great settlements of uh, Peach Springs and Skunk Springs, uh, uh, Skunk Springs along the Chuscas here, not far from Tohatchi, New Mexico. Those were huge uh, basket maker three, P1, then P2 uh, settlements that had huge life because groundwater was near the surface in a number of consolidated locations nearby. Those were huge great houses. And the, that they were engineered specifically to resonate ritually with Chaco Canyon is absolutely obvious to several of my colleagues who with some engineer friends and an astronomer at Chaco Canyon calculated that from the forecourt of Skunk Springs, Great House, on the solstice, the exact same view, the exact same view, view of the astronomical changes at the exact same moment takes place in both the courtyard at Skunk Springs and the courtyard at Pueblo Bonito. Not small time engineering stuff. Rather complicated gives a whole new meaning to underlying sophistication that folks who romanticize this system may not be aware of. Also dealing with multiple precipitation and water resource issues, temperature, elevation, patchiness, bimodal, unimodal, and moving the stuff around requires people who do nothing except obsess about movement of goods, when to plant, where to move stored corn, how to bail a district out. Roads were being built starting 950, 
which was a rough patch in climate. A second set of roads was built and engineered in about 1040, 1050. Not as rough a patch because there wasn't as much variability year to year in rainfall after about 1000 AD. It wasn't better than usual over the region. But one of the parameters got easier to deal with. And that gave Chaco another edge for growth in the mid 10 hundreds. And in that edge for growth, what had begun to happen in the Red Mesa Valley was that already 150 years of plantings had taken place at some of these farmsteads. As the demand for corn went high because the system continued to grow, it appears from the condition of skeletons that have been analyzed from Red Mesa Valley sites. Two profound things, one of which I mentioned in the last lecture, which is infant mortality was at 50% or higher in most of the Red Mesa districts, which means there was not going to be another generation to build new farms. All you were doing was replacing population at best. So population growth had stalled in the Red Mesa district. The nutritional status of Red Mesa farmers by 1100 was so desperate that infant mortality was well over 50%. And by about 1050, 1060 AD, this traditional dominance of Red Mesa pottery fades and is replaced by Gallup black on white. Produced in this district, which is the southernmost extension in an ecologically diverse area of the bimodal rainfall district. What we note then from the late 10 hundreds, 1070s to 1090s, is that rainfall becomes erratic and the district in the summer, in the summer monsoon district, and the group hit the hardest is in the Red Mesa Valley. Those folks are starving. There is no more market for their pottery at Chaco Canyon. The Chaco Canyon elites, engineers, start building roads to the north and to the northwest. One branches off here. Those roads are bigger, wider. Places like Alto and New Alto are built. Warrior burials begin to be found in some of the great houses never before. And so the system is growing, but not everywhere. So the Red Mesa Valley, by the 1080s, 1090s, is like Youngstown, Braddock, PA, Detroit, And its farmers are beginning to walk away. Some undoubtedly wind up getting labor on the road crews. This is a frenzy of building activity. So if roads, the rituals, and the great houses, which was the formulaic response that the great house elites depended on, was good in the 1050s A.D., as the droughts of the 1070s, 1080s hit and took out one farming district, instead of adapting in other ways or moving population voluntarily, they cut one district loose. They did huge amounts of building projects in the 1080s, 1075 to 1100 AD period. And did a lot of infill in the north central part of the San Juan Basin. Putting new great houses where there had been none before. 
and putting a great house there to attract farming communities, the reverse of what they had done a hundred years before. It worked for a time. And then came another set of droughts in the 1110s, 15s, to 20s. And in response to that last episode, the Chacoan elites didn't engage in much more in the way of road projects. Instead, the architecture of the Chacoan world begins to change. The open courtyards at the great houses, which had been open in some of them for 250 years, are walled off. Some of the road segments that always came next to great houses, some went right through what became four courts as great houses expanded and consumed what had been the original road. Control gates were built near the outer walls of the great houses. Watchtowers were built along the Great North Road, which was 33 feet wide in spots. It's terribly expensive. New Great House style buildings were built in the middle of nowhere with no farming community, storerooms, and no ritual space for the first time. And so by the early 1100s A.D., we get a phenomenon that is really only recently emerging. And that is one where some of these northern great houses begin to get built in the approaches to Mesa Verde, some even beyond. So Chaco is losing population by the early 1100s A.D. And it's losing them in this direction, north. And so large sites like Salmon Ruin, Jacket, a bunch of sites like Ida Jean and Wallace in the Montezuma Valley of uh, Colorado, uh, Aztec, Aztec North, Earl Morris's Site 41, uh, right just north of the uh, Colorado line. All of those sites are built. And they are in the rectangular style of the later great houses in Chaco Canyon. They have, many of them have tower kivas, which served as kivas and watchtowers. Um, one of the ones in the southern district was Kenya'a, uh, very near Crown Point, New Mexico. Standing tall house from which one of the Navajo clans uh, claims descent. And that growth in great houses was rapid and it was a new supply route for meat hunted in northern high country, corn grown in the waters of the Animas and San Juan rivers. It's been analyzed, it's been published in science. At Pueblo Benito you have corn from that time period that isn't sourced from any of their old settlements and has so far not been found outside of a great house. So what you have in the early 1100s AD is the great house elites are building what I refer to as a shadow system of supply that isn't designed to prompt up the core of their Chacoan world anymore. It is their own system to continue to keep their lifestyle, their security, and their families safe. By the 1130s, it just wasn't working. There were small communities of Chacoans up in the Montezuma Valley, Aztec and whatnot. These are sometimes uh, referred to in textbook as Cyan communities. That is, the assumption is that the sons of great men at Chaco founded them. There were very few Chacoan women. The pottery that was found at these, as is found, was made by local women. 
So it does appear that some, some high-status males exited the core of the Chacoan world, took local wives, and built little islands of sort of ersatz Chacoan great house society, probably with the assumption that they would remain connected to the core. But by 1139 AD, the last roof beam in the Chacoan world is laid at a fortification along the north road called Kin Bisani, House Atop Shale. And in that same year, 300 miles to the south, the last membrane roof beam ever found and dated was also laid. So what you had was a drought in proportions and protracted enough that has been like the last few years here in New Mexico. You get a little, a lot of rain some months, nothing, 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 little, nothing, 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 and you can't read what it's going to be like. And if there's anything that farmers can't handle, it's that level of unpredictability and a regional system that had quit responding to their needs and was looking after the needs of a portion of the population. Had the elites built fewer roads and built more water systems similar to those that they had at Chaco Canyon, where they had collected the runoff and created head gates coming off those mesas, there's all kinds of mesa country in here that if they had exported the techniques and the labor, they could have stabilized to a degree at least some of these districts. But that did not happen. And so, ordinary Chaco and farmers walk away. There's some violence, but they walk away. It's, for the average farmer, in the 1130s, 1140s. Rather like the Grapes of Wrath. Six years of Dust Bowl, Oklahoma and Texas, I'm out of here for California. But where people went in the mid-1100s was to the high country all around the perimeters of the San Juan Basin. Because summer rains bring a lot more moisture to the high country. So the Chacoan model of eating small game animals as a farmer, mostly rodents, large cob corn, and working extraordinary hours of strenuous labor is over. And what the small farmers were trying to do was to go back to ancestral places first where they could participate in an economic system similar to what their great, 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 great grandparents had been involved in, which was hunting, foraging, some high country horticulture. They got more rainfall. Many moved into those uplands. Problem. Cold nighttime temperatures. You can't grow the small or the large cob corn up there. So every unit of labor gets you less corn. And so many people left the Chacoan system that those upland districts in the mid 1100s AD become centers of local and regional conflict. Where lots of people died due to starvation 
and conflict. In the Guyana country up here, estimates from a number of sites that have been excavated 20, 30 years ago and reported, actually it's 40 years ago now and reported, suggest that 60% of all adult skeletal packages ever found show signs of overt violence. Men, women, children. Wars of attrition locally. Sort of like what you would see and what we responded to as a nation for a while as Yugoslavia came undone and went back into its component parts. As most anthropologists and archaeologists accept the idea that for a while there was a regional Chaco and identity tied up with good times, growth, ritual, and that nuances of ethnic and or linguistic differences were mottled and muted for a time. And as long as it was growing, it went well. And as long as the Chacoans could assess the value of goods and the probabilities of rainfall and keep track of what was going on in these districts all over this region and move things to where it was needed, most people got enough out of it that they wanted to stay in it. But when it could no longer perform, many left, and each farmer who left took a million calories a year with them from every acre that they had farmed. And our calculations were that each one of these 11-person farmstead families were by that time farming 6.9 acres of mixed corn, beans, and squash when they did the beans. Every family that left took another million acres. The 180 great houses that are outlying, some say it's 200, but I've been conservative. The minimum cost of those 180 great houses outside of Chaco Canyon in labor, direct labor, that didn't make food, is 25 billion calories. It took 25,000 acres of hand-tilled corn to build those great houses at a minimum. The great houses in Chaco Canyon, there's only 12 of them, but they're among the biggest. That's a little over 2 billion calories. And the roads, I can't compute them. I simply have to get a couple crews on the ground to duplicate the work next to where some of the roads are with the replica tools of the era and start measuring. I don't know how I'm going to fund or find that way to do that research, but that has to happen. We can know the cost of the major road segments. And even a couple of them figuring the cost will tell us how many more acres had to be farmed. At some point, there wasn't any farmable land left that you could get a reasonable return on in the San Juan Basin. And so the Chacoan era was that every growth model has a point in time where it needs to spend as much on sustainability and stability and invest in homeostasis as it had once in the drivers to keep growing. Now, you can forgive the Chacoans. But you can't forgive modern business models, which do the same thing. A few years ago, 15, 20 years ago, some of you may have even been involved or been investors. There was this uh, Robert Merton Myron Scholes uh, long-term capital management. Uh, any of you familiar with that? few of you? Well, these guys won a Nobel Prize. 
and they won a Nobel Prize for a growth model of investing that in theory was zero risk. And they had based part of the growth model and the investment model on the mathematics of a, literally a Japanese rocket scientist by the name of Ito, who had done a series of calculations that allowed you to redirect missiles in mid-flight in very rapid order. And that mathematics was was in, of interest to these two guys because they figured that if they invested in the world market at a rate slightly greater than the overall growth of the world market and they correctly assess values of commodities from one place in time to another that in theory the risks of investment would be near zero and they took subscribers, they won the Nobel Prize, and then made a company long-term capital management. They didn't settle for just the prize, they, now we're going for the big money. And in the process, they grew rapidly and stunningly to where there were guys on Wall Street who couldn't quite make, I think they had a 10 million uh, minimum buy-in, couldn't quite make the grade, whining, okay. And then, a couple things went wrong. <laughs> they miscalculated on the value of Russian commodities because there was a crisis in the ruble. And then a month later, there was a blow-up in a couple of South a Southeast Asian uh, um, currencies and a dislocation in oil prices. Two major flaws. And the thing started coming unraveling at a rate much greater than it had ever been built. They, they were losing money by the hour. Came undone. Um, many articles written about it. Well, the Chocolate world had to do two things. It had to judge the risks and the values of crops in different districts constantly. And it had to determine that it could grow its agricultural enterprise at a rate slightly faster than population growth. And it did that from about 875 A.D. to about 1075 A.D. And it did it well but it didn't have a plan B. Now, if Merton and Scholes had taken my class at UNM, <laughs> they'd have known that the problem wasn't getting there, the problem was staying there. You can forgive the Chacoans, they didn't know, because this was a growth model that was created from the ground up. All the talk about Mesoamerica notwithstanding, and there were contacts. These guys built this. These guys invented this. Their farmers figured out the, the ways to get maximum production. They're the ones who figured out that you water when the moon is full and the uptake higher percentage of the, of the moisture. They got most of it right until they became so big that the cost of their infrastructure and the inability to maintain production in their core. When they started exporting the last sites for their own system outside the core, they were making their last investments in production centers that would never make the core whole again. Sounds familiar in a way, doesn't it? On the other hand, we do know better. And we can do better. Because after a period of about 150 years, where it was really tough, climate did not play ball with the descendants of those folks who built the Chacoan system either from the farms up or the great houses down. But their descendants made it, created far more efficient societies. 
and are with us today. There were a few things they had to give up on, though. Lavish infrastructure that didn't produce food. And the scale of difference between the elites and the ordinary producers. And we know that the scale got out of hand through ethnographic evidence and stories of the great gambler at Chaco. In a world where most scholars say no Native Americans ever had the concept of owning anything. It was land used. In general, I agree. But at the height of the Chacoan period and its last orgy of growth in the early 1100s AD, there's a mythic figure called the Great Gambler. Have any of you heard the Great Gambler stories? Well, the Great Gambler went from place to place in games of chance and won or lost whole villages the value of their corn and the value of their labor. And so we know that in the final hour at Chaco, that behaviors had taken on a different turn. All the talk about Mesoamerica notwithstanding and there were contacts, these guys built this, these guys invented this, their farmers figured out the, the ways to get maximum production, they're the ones who figured out that you water when the moon is full and that uptake higher percentage of the, of the moisture. They got most of it right until they became so big that the cost of their infrastructure and the inability to maintain production in their core when they started exporting the last sites for their own system outside the core, they were making their last investments in production centers that would never make the core whole again. Sounds familiar in a way, doesn't it? On the other hand, we do know better. And we can do better because after a period of about 150 years where it was really tough, climate did not play ball with the descendants of those folks who built the Chacoan system, either from the farms up or the great houses down. But their descendants made it, created far more efficient societies and are with us today. There were a few things they had to give up on, though. Lavish infrastructure that didn't produce food. And the scale of difference between the elites and the ordinary producers. And we know that the scale got out of hand through ethnographic evidence and stories of the great gambler at Chaco. In a world where most scholars say no Native Americans ever had the concept of owning anything. It was land used. In general, I agree. But at the height of the Chacoan period and its last orgy of growth in the early 1100s AD, there's a mythic figure called the Great Gambler. Have any of you heard the Great Gambler stories? Well, the Great Gambler went from place to place in games of chance and won or lost whole villages, the value of their corn and the value of their labor. And so we know that in the final hour at Chaco, that behaviors had taken on a different turn. The people there had everything. And the people who ran the place found it not enough. And so the gods took it away from them. Slightly different 
idiom than we use today, but the dynamics pertain to every large industrial society. The trick isn't getting big. The trick isn't getting complex. The trick is not getting too big or too complex and not investing in sustainability. Thank you very, very much. Well, I'm sure there are no questions, <laughs> but just in case there are, uh, would you take questions, Dave? Yeah, I'll take a couple. <laughs> I, I'm, I had eye surgery a few days ago. I'm having a hard time seeing you folks out here under these lights, so well, yeah. I'm going to step down a step or two if you don't mind. That's great. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, would you I can. Would, uh, Dave, would you repeat the question, please, so that everybody can hear it? Yeah. Can I estimate the population of Chaco Canyon in the San Juan Basin? The answer is uh, every other anthropologist, archaeologist in the Southwest has done that. None of the other 900 believe them. Um, <laughs> and then mine is, I am convinced that there were 30,000 farmsteads give or take a couple thousand at the height of this. And that the average farmstead was 16 rooms, and that means 25 to 30 people. So I'm going to go 30,000 times 25. That's in Chaco Canyon? And that's, in that is over 60,000 square miles. And what that's about, about 12 people per square mile. And what about in Chaco Canyon itself? You know... I think it was four people, and that they were really out of control. <laughs> they, there, are two or, there are two or three hundred farmsteads in Chaco Canyon, so you give it 1,500 in the region, and then in the great houses, it's really a huge, huge academic fight over how many of those rooms were lived in. I think it was a couple thousand at the most, but again, I won't, in my lifetime, we will not come closer uh, to agreement. Another question. <laughs> yes. You keep talking about the elites in Chaco Canyon. Yeah. Yeah, let me. Okay, I couldn't hear all of it. I'm sorry. I couldn't quite hear all of yeah, it. Yeah, would you repeat that question, please? Yeah, let me tell you, the, the adult males in, in sites like Pueblo Benito, Chetro Kettle, that were excavations that have taken place, average two inches taller than adult males from any of the farmsteads. Yeah. Two, the incidence of infant mortality from reconstructed burial populations in the great houses at Chaco Canyon where excavation has taken place show 9% infant mortality. It's 50 to 60% in the Red Mesa Valley and 20% in the outlying great houses. Um, 22 kinds of pottery in the average Chaco and great house, six kinds in the average farmstead. Okay. Another question. You want to take your second question? <laughs> sure. Is, is there any way of taking the elites in historic pueblos and using those as a way of considering... What no, because their behavior changed so much. Be, uh, right, so much. I'm doing that lecture in the spring. <laughs> yeah, I'm giving myself a break till March or April. <laughs> 
And on that note, what he's going to do in the spring, let's uh, again thank David Stewart. Thank you. Thank you all very much.